And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from everything epic, making the... Whose whose output has typically been in the realm of of board and card games up until up until this point, and is now making their venture into the world of twenty sided dice. The one with with the recently funded Dragon Thrones, the one and only Chris Batalris, and I'm pretty sure I mispronounced the name, and I apologize in advance for that. No problem. How you doing? How you doing today, man? No problem. Everything's great. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I've, I've definitely uh, been in gaming for quite some time, board games as well as RPGs, and uh, I'm glad to be here with you today. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sure if I dug, I'm sure if I dug back far enough, I'd find an RPG entry in everything epic. But for as long as for as long as I've known your company, they've mostly been doing, um, they've mostly been doing board and card games. Oh yeah, that's true. I'm just saying, my, me personally, since mm -hmm. fifth grade. Well, speaking of that, I it's tradition to open with the origin story of sorts. So, walk me through how you first got introduced to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, literally, as I said, in fifth grade, uh, many a year ago, I uh, literally was leaving elementary school. And I saw this other kid, and I said to him, hey, I bet you don't know what Magic the Gathering is. And he was like, I bet you I do. And I'm like, oh, yeah? He's like, yeah. I was like, all right, well, meet me after school tomorrow and, and show me uh, what you got. He was like, okay. And so this kid shows up. His name was Keith, uh, oh, one of my oldest friends. And he actually does have Magic cards. And uh, we became friends from there. And uh, after a while, we started hanging out. I went to his house. I met his, uh, his stepfather, who... Uh, is an old school uh, grognard, we would call them, and now I am one because <laughs> I'm old now. And uh, he introduced us to um, the the first time we've ever played D and D. We both started off as as fighters, of course, as uh, as many uh, have in the past. Um, and so we uh, started our first, I guess, call it campaign that didn't last very long uh and it was the one and only keep on the borderlands mm -hmm. and there's two major epic memories from that other than of course it being our first foray into D, &D. but uh the first memory of course is briark and the last one is turning to stone and dying from a medusa so that's uh, literally uh, not the first session but it was maybe like three or four sessions in where we both died and then we were allowed after we first we got our first characters, uh, we were allowed to choose whatever we wanted. And uh, we started to go into all kinds of different characters and learning about um, tons of cool new advanced stuff. So uh, I would say uh, I'm, I'm fairly old school. Certainly not uh, the first RPG uh, you know module ever, but it's, I guess, the second. <laughs> so that's kind of my, my origin story. That's all the way back in fifth grade. So uh, the 90s, and uh, from there, played tons and tons and tons of different RPGs all my life. Always been a gigantic fan. And uh, from, from, again, D&D, &D, Pathfinder, Shadowrun, Paranoia, GURPS, uh, Warhammer, a fantasy role-playing game, one of my favorites, um, Call of Cthulhu. I played pretty much everything and anything you could imagine, Fate, um, and I love, I love role-playing. And so uh, back in 2015, 2014, I started to create our own role-playing game with a good friend of mine named Evan, mm -hmm. where we wanted to create it into a giant uh, live-action experience. And that's where Dragon Thrones was born. Mm -hmm. But instead of it just becoming an immediate tabletop, it actually started off as a live-action role-playing game that evolved into a LARP hybrid. Uh, that's what we like to call it, which has to do with tabletop and live action role playing all together. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my my villain or hero role playing origin story so to speak. And here <laughs> yeah. we are today. Yeah. Um 
Yeah. Since you mentioned since you mentioned um, playing a huge playing a huge variety, which is which is always always something I encu I encourage. I don't. There's nothing there's nothing wrong with someone being a D and D lifer, but um, it com but it comes with consequences. Oh yeah. Um, but there's a few there's a few names that I that I'd like to I'd like to throw your way and, s and see if you had um see if you had dipped into in one form or another. Um, some sure. of them are classic, and some of them might be a little bit more niche. So um, I'll start with the one that's been my whipping boy for the pa for the past twenty years, um, rifts. Rifts. Uh, I don't think I've actually played rifts before, but I have seen the art for rifts in the past. Yeah, the co the cover art for it alone is 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 hard to ignore. It's just, um, Palladium Palladium Games that I have a. I have a history with. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, hero system. Mm hmm. Now, uh, did you when you played it? Was it st was was it hero system on its own, or was it still in was it still in the umbrella of champions? Probably champions, and it would have been again a lot of years ago. Yeah, it's, there's, it's still the same. It's still the same system. It's just one evolved into the other since the line between universal games and superhero games is so thin. Yep. Um, Savage Worlds. Oh yeah, I played Savage Worlds. Um, Multiple different formats. Uh, you you already mentioned Fate, so I'll go with another one that's ver that's very narrativist. Um, any anything re in the umbrella of Powered by the Apocalypse. Oh yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, as a matter of fact, there's a new game from a friend of mine. Uh, and he's called the Modern Gods, inspired by, um, you know, uh, kind of like the American God show and, mm -hmm. and kind of that whole world that he's he's working on and creating. His name's Mike, and uh, he's a good friend of mine. And that's one of the, the Powered by the Apocalypse games that I've been I've been playing for for some time. Right. I'll Great go, Yeah. And lastly, I'll go a little bit left. I'll go a little bit left field on this. Um, Feng Shui. Feng Shui. Kind of like uh, a little bit of a Big Trouble Little China RPG, eh? Some something like something like that, along along with a bunch along with a bunch of other stuff, because the Chi War is nuts. I haven't played it myself, but I uh, I definitely definitely heard about it, and uh, I definitely would love to try it someday. Mm -hmm. What it wrote specifically reminded me of, from what I was told, it was kind of like action movie uh, RPG. Um, which Big Trouble Little China the R would like live in as an RPG. I made the board game, so I like people were always approaching me, talking to me about Feng Shui. Mm -hmm. But uh, how about you with uh, something to the effect of uh, Mafia D twenty? Have you ever heard of that? Um, I've heard, I've heard, but um, there, but when it came to when it came to D twenty games, especially especially in the um, early two thousands, there's a million. Um, huh? There was like a million of them. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it. It was very easy to get. It was very easy to get lo to to get things lost in the shuffle. That's why I call the years from two thousand to two thousand five the OGL bubble. <laughs> yep. Um, and my my LGS absolutely hit, at, grew grew from someone who was a big fan of D twenty system to absolutely hating it because of how much of a flood it was on on his shelves. <laughs> yeah, I uh, had a, co a couple of weird ones. Like uh, EverQuest, the RPG, for instance. Yeah, that's a blast from the past book. Probably extremely rare. I, I have it. I have it on scan and um. Are you familiar uh, at all with Sturgeon's Law? Sturgeon's Law, no. Um, Sturgeon's Law it is anything. Anything can be art, but ninety percent of art is crap. And in the same vein, a, a lot of the um, a lot of the D twenty books that came that came out in that bubble. While there were certainly there were certainly some standouts, there was a lot of not that good. Sure. Uh, much in the same much in the same way as say the flood of games that were on that were on the old Atari. That was one of that was one of the factors with the video game crash. Yep. Um. But I think, but if but as far as I remember, I know I'd heard about Mafia D twenty, but um. I don't. I don't think I delved. I don't think I delved too into it. Large, it was largely kind of like part of the Sopranos feel. You know, it had mm -hmm. that. Uh, you could you could be a mook, you know, and you'd start leveling up that way. Just one of those, one of those interesting old school things that when you play it with the creator, it's amazing. Yeah. You know, 
And that's that's kind of the key is some of these games from back in the day, when you're sitting down and playing with the creator, like it was their dream. And when they're describing stuff and getting into character, it just made role playing epic, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to Dragon, when it comes to um, Dragon Thrones, now you you did give you get you gave a bit of the origin story on on how on how it came to be, but what I'm curious about is how is how the how the setting came to be. What so, what sort of things you drew upon as your as inspiration and and why you wanted to go with a fantasy dystopia, which is something you don't see all that often. It's true. Yeah, some years ago, you know. Uh, Game of Thrones was really big back then. And, um, you know, we really wanted to find a way to create an experience that um, got people into kind of the, these houses so they could have interesting dynamics between characters and their team itself. I don't know if you've done any LARPing before, but there's, there's so many different types of LARPs. But when you're in a really big situation, you got like 100 players, you know, uh, being all alone is not nearly as fun for most people as being with a party. Yeah. So when you have your own house, which is kind of like your team, mm -hmm. it gives you that feeling of not being all alone in the sea of tons and tons of players. You always kind of have somebody who you, you know, can hang out with, play with, and, and work together with on different objectives. Just like the feeling of being in a D&D &D party. So we kind of started with that idea of, in Game of Thrones, you kind of have your house. So in Dragon Thrones, we wanted to have those house mechanics, like mm -hmm. strong, the political aspect, the role-playing aspect, mm -hmm. really, really strong. That's honestly one of the biggest things that came uh, from the Game of Thrones inspiration aspect. When we originally created it, the first iteration of Dragon Thrones actually had kind of this thing where we started where the, the, uh, the Draconians, and it's funny because now that uh, Fizzbands is out, They've uh, kind of brought back their own version of the Draconians here in D&D. &D. Uh, but we, we started the Draconians up for our, for our player character races um, like seven or eight years ago now while we were working on them. And uh, Draconians were kind of like from Game of Thrones what the uh, kind of like the, the call them the, the walkers, the ice zombies were uh, from Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. But they weren't they weren't mindless uh, killers. They, they were like people from the south that other people were afraid of. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of like our first, first, first iteration where these draconians were coming back to the world after being gone for so long. And they were coming up from the South into the North from like the Firelands. And there were different races of draconians and they also didn't like each other. So there's lots of interesting dynamics. And mm -hmm. back then it wasn't a dystopia. It was more of a world being invaded by an, a race that was lost from long ago. Mm -hmm. And so that evolved over the years and we began to refine the idea. And recently we came up with kind of this new, uh, this new universe that creates even more interesting conflicts and dynamics between houses and characters, because that's always our main objective is to create interesting role-playing and um, storyline um, objectives. For us, it's not always about just big combat. It's about characters working together and against each other, creating alliances and creating enemies and doing all of those things uh, for role playing. So uh, we kind of um, were like, man, how do we make it so that war can kind of always happen every certain amount of time? Well, what if there was this evil, but also benevolent on the outside leader that literally forced everyone to go to war every generation? And so you had to go to war. Well, why would they listen to him? Well, what if the leaders of each one of these kingdoms was given an extremely powerful magical artifact as a gift, a dragon throne, mm -hmm. that gave them ultimate power and kept them in power as a leader? Okay, okay. So what if those leaders had uh, great allegiance to this evil, overarching leader that forced them all to go to war? And what if every time they went to war, the winning house, their leader got to ascend and become immortal and gain even more power. So now the heads of all of the houses have high incentive to follow along, follow the fold in this strange, crazy dystopia as the high class, quote unquote, the, the upper echelon of the houses and lead their kingdoms into battle. Well, why won't the houses just rise up against them? Well, 
the house that wins also all of the people in that house, they gain some longevity along with the leader who becomes immortal. And that house gets to rebuild at an even greater and more powerful rate because they're higher in the favor of the golden dragon king. Mm -hmm. And so we created this hierarchy and almost sort of like a generational changing caste system. Again, a little bit of the idea inspired by something like Hunger Games, but mm -hmm. a little bit of that Lord of the Rings feel. And it takes mm -hmm. kind of all of these great fictions from the past and, and things that have inspired us over the years. And it creates this cool, unique universe with these awesome and really fleshed out houses and this really unique dragon god that, uh, that in human form rules over uh, all of these other houses but lets them rule themselves as well in the in the in between in the generations feeding off of their essence off of their magic that they basically create by going to war mm -hmm. so i know i just said a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. but just just kind of imagine this weird unique this this universe that's kind of created um based out of these houses and these interesting characters revolving around these magical super powerful dragon thrones that these High rulers, kings and queens of all of these different realms. They're all kings and queens mm -hmm. that are led by this one ultimate dragon king in the center of the map, so to mm -hmm. speak. And so that's where Dragon Thrones of the Golden Age, our current new universe that we're basing the RPG setting on, mm -hmm. from. Now, whenever... I should. I will note as an aside. I ha I had um. I have di I have dipped into LARPs um here here and there, um, mostly 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 vampire LARPs. Lar largely be largely because of the fact that it's a it's a bit it's a bit awkward to be doing to be doing a whole lot of physical stuff in in a LARPs when you're one foot taller than everybody else. Our LARPs are very physical light. They're all about the intrigue and the RPG. That's why we have so much tabletop mixed in with the role playing. And we know that there's a lot of people out there who just aren't physically capable or mm -hmm. interested in whapping each other with foam swords, which is a lot of fun for some people. And mm -hmm. you're roughing it out in the wilderness and that's part of the experience. But what we do is very similar to what the vampire larks do, yeah. where it's more about the role playing, the intrigue, the, the inter um, interfaction stuff going on. We also have a mega game in ours, which is a little like a kind of a giant board game. And some tabletop stuff flipped in too, so mm -hmm. we totally get that. It's 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 it, it kind of incorporates all that, and that's why the tabletop RPG for us was such a an, an, an obvious thing that we should work on because it's just it's something we were already doing in the LARP. Mm -hmm. And it probably wouldn't surprise you at all if I said if I said that a lot of times when I did, I was um I was a Ventru. <laughs> <laughs> I like Ventru as well. Yeah. They are they are object they are objectively the best because because they run the world so you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. I don't know if you know, but we also made a Vampire the Masquerade official game called Blood Feud, mm -hmm. which is something you might want to talk about at another time. But it's yeah. a four to thirty two player mega board game. Mm -hmm. RPG meets LARP meets board game. Four to thirty two players. It's epic. Yeah. So we're we're deep into the uh, vampire universe as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, now, whenever now um I will I will admit that when it comes to when it comes to campaign settings that that are heavily that are heavily based in um pol in that kind of political faction approach. There's there's always there's always two names that come that come to mind for me. Um, one of them is Legend of the Five Rings. Which mm -hmm. I, which I have which yeah. I have been enjoying in one form or another for decades. The other is um, Fading Suns, which I did a review of about a year ago. Um, that was before third edition came out, so that review is kind of out of date. That's <laughs> something I need to look into. I've never played Fading Suns. Um, I've described Fading Suns' um, victory point core mechanic system as D twenty blackjack. They have a victory point mechanic in their RPG. Um, they call they call their core mechanic the victory point system. The way the way that it works is, it's it's technically a roll under system. You take take attribute plus skill. That's the number that, that you're trying to roll under, um, plus and minus any situational modifiers, of course. 
but the key thing is is that instead of trying to go as low as possible, you're trying to go as close to the line as you can. Interesting. And the closer to the line that you get, the more victory points you get, meaning the more degrees of success that you have. Okay. Hence, what, hence why I call it D20 Blackjack. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and truth and truth be told, um, fate, um, Fading Suns kind of started at kind of started as a 4x game, which I'd I'd only recommend people play with a sufficient amount of mods because the original version was kind of jank. Mm -hmm. Um. But in both of those cases, a issue a issue that can that can crop up is the is um co is continuity lockout, and this is an issue that that is not unique to those two examples. And it's largely something that comes up when when you're tr when when bringing when bringing people into the setting and fi and figuring out how to how to run um, adventures w adventures with it. Um, mm -hmm. Legend of the Five Rings ha has has the has a bit has a baked in solution to this with um, player characters being Emerald Magistrates, so you can have them come from different clans, but still but still still have a degree of cohesion and still fit within the setting. Um, Fading Suns doesn't have this problem as much, but when it comes to when it comes to that competitiveness of Dragon Thrones with the, with with each mm -hmm. kingdom wanting wanting to get ascension, um, how do you how do you make how do you make it so that you could have player characters from di from different kingdoms um, cooperating? It's a great great question, and uh, it's funny because that's something that we've always thought of like very heavily. Mm -hmm. So one of the big things that we did in Dragon Thrones to quote unquote solve that uh, the number one is is that there's multiple ages to play in. Mm -hmm. um, but the two main places to play are either during Ascension time or in between Ascensions, which is called the Tranquility. So during the Tranquility, uh, teams are not allowed to be at war by, by legal decree uh, of the Golden Dragon King. So mm -hmm. there might be like secret skirmishes, there might be spies, there might be, you know, assassinations and, and secret things that are like below, uh, you know, below board. But, um, any open conflict is dealt with extremely swiftly and uh, with um, major prejudice. So mm -hmm. the uh, the Golden Dragon King will send basically some extremely powerful forces, kind of like the Emperor in Dune, in a way, where they just send them and just obliterate you, and you end up going down on the ranking scale, which means everyone suffers. Um, so it's kind of like one of those major disincentivizers during the Tranquility. So questing and um, adventures during the tranquility uh, are sometimes um, things of necessity, magical issues in the world, um, uh, maybe trying to get artifacts, general adventuring, intrigue into other houses from another house. So you can play all as one house. You can play as mixed allied houses. Mm -hmm. And you can also play as um, completely mixed houses during the, during the tranquility very easily. During the Ascension, it's a little bit different. Um, there's, there's a few different ways that you can do it. Uh, but the, the overarching way during an actual uh, time of Ascension, when it's literally open war between houses, to go off and go on adventures, uh, is if um, your houses have created some sort of an allegiance mm -hmm. to have your, your uh, players to go do that. So high rulers can make those, those literal... Uh, agreements at any time to go and send off adventurers to work together to go and, and complete specific objectives. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, either that or the Golden Dragon King specifically tells you what to do and then you basically have to do that. So that's kind of a deus ex machina version of, of how to get the players to do that, but that's during the time of Ascension. But each house has multiple allies um, and enemies that they're going to be mm -hmm. dealing with. So generally speaking, there's always options, really cool ways to have options of houses working together mm -hmm. in a campaign. Um, so oftentimes you're going to either be during the Tranquility or if you're during the Ascension, you're going to be probably playing as one or two allied houses, generally speaking. And that's just the way you plan out your, your group at the beginning of the game. Figure out how they want to be. In Dragon Thrones, you can play any class race combo that you want from the Dragon Throne setting. 
You can, of course, port anything from Dragon Thrones' uh, over 30 new subclasses and our new manipulator class over into um, your own setting that you want. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, you can play any class race combo from our setting or bring those, those characters into Dragon Thrones if you so desire. But there are um, a, a ton of new subclasses and tons of recommended class combos class and subclass combos mm -hmm. for each house to thematically match that house. So every house has their own strengths and weaknesses based on their lore and their background and, and their races that are available and that kind of thing. So some houses, for instance, have no clerics. That's by design of their, their thematic re you know, relevance. But they'll have other healers that are more empowered or we give them specific ways to heal that are a little bit better so mm -hmm. they become balanced but they might need allies from other houses that can be clerics. You can also be a cleric. They mm -hmm. just don't have recommended houses, uh, recommended uh, character classes that are clerics in that house, as a for instance, just an example. Mm -hmm. And that's done for thematic reasons because of the house type they are. They might not have those types of temples or those types of belief systems in that house. Mm -hmm. You know, because each one is very unique and distinct. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> I would like to... Go I would... Before we before we get into the mechanics of of what you, of what a character gets from their cho from their choice of house, um, I would like to go I would like to go over briefly the ten, the ten great the ten great houses just sure. to, just to get kind of a obviously we can't go into the full history of them because just just the um just the sample document on one house alone was thirty eight pages and multiply <laughs> that by ten. Multiply that amount by ten, by ten, and we have um, interesting times. Yeah, it's it's a lot of lore we've worked on for mm -hmm. almost eight years. I mean, it's it's a ton and ton of content, and for five E, we're giving a lot of content mm -hmm. for each house. We've created, uh, as I said, basically three subclasses for each one, and a brand new base class, the manipulator class. So mm -hmm. uh, let's let's go over the houses. I'll start from the top, um, and again, each one of these houses, um, either was one of the quote-unquote human houses of old that was in Cambria before the time of the dragons, before the dragons came to Cambria in search of essence, in search of a way to, to gain magic, to basically eat that magic to sustain mm -hmm. themselves, before the dragon wars, before they were all dead. So the, there was basically four big main houses that were on Cambria, Mm -hmm. Plus, there was uh, ancient elves that were all throughout Cambria, but um, those elves um, were spread out throughout the entire world. Many of them were either destroyed or, or defeated or, or fled the world or in hiding or joined other houses because of the great wars of the past. And it only left one big main elven house, the celestial elves, uh, remaining. Mm -hmm. And then the draconian houses, and I'll go through each one. Uh, the draconian houses were created by the dragon gods when they arrived in cambria mm -hmm. and so the draconian houses that remain um, are basically the greatest and most powerful of those houses that survived to become basically draconian led houses because during the time of the dragon and the dragon gods each of the of the 11 dragon gods took their own kingdom for their own and they made their own draconians, most of them, not all of them, but most mm -hmm. of them made their own draconians to lead their house. And they're basically a human dragon hybrid. So they kind of look like humans uh, and uh, with, with basically scales and, and some draconian and dragon type um, magics that, that they can use and, and, and some of those abilities. Mm -hmm. So starting at the top, we'll go with House Ardmore. Mm -hmm. House Ardmore, if you kind of imagine them, they are a very uh, kind of a rich... Um, they have gold mines. They have a very unique and interesting feel to them. Mm -hmm. And their ancient uh, lore puts them with a god that somehow lived in their mountains called Letitius, which would give, um, give out gifts uh, to all of the people, kind of a cross between Santa Claus and a giant dwarf. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the people of Ardmore would worship Letitius uh, because... They, he would be, they would be rewarded with golden gems. And so um, they, they have a very interesting feel to them. But they have, of course, evolved over time with their dragon, Sargon Mar, the Emperor of Envy. Mm -hmm. um, and before Sargon Mar was defeated, uh, left a, a big mark 
on on their their feel and their world. So they're extremely um, ambitious people. They carry that reputation with pride, and they're all about kind of gold and spycraft and intrigue. And they have a beautiful, lush, green, and mountainous uh, area that they they live within. Hmm. And as a matter of fact, House Ardmore is the last winner of the Ascension. Literally, in our lore, in our in our actual um, live action game, this past uh, this past summer. Uh, Ardmore actually won our live action ascension. So they are uh, the top house right now mm-hmm. in, in the Dragon Thrones uh, living universe. Mm-hmm. Um, the next house is House Lancaster. And uh, they are, um, it would, it's funny because you would think, oh, are they, are they inspired by the Lannisters? Uh, not really, but a little bit. So they have a little bit of that feel of look with their colors and, and kind of uh, the, the feel of what they are, are like. But they're a little bit more of a, uh, a farming, uh, agricultural stronghouse. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so they have um, control basically over over the greatest farmlands, and uh, they supply the food to basically all of Cambria, which puts them in very powerful position. Mm-hmm. So they kind of uh, are a little bit at odds with Ardmore, where Ardmore has the gold, and, and Lancaster has the food, right? And um, Rather than being uh, more religious, they are a little bit more about their own bloodline and a little bit of a blood magic feel. Kind of uh, Mm -hmm. their upper echelon deals with weird uh, cultist feels, um, and they do some kind of um, some interesting uh, (laughs) cult-like bloodline rite of birth, rite of passage Mm -hmm. um, intrigue within their house. But uh, again, it's all about uh, controlling food and um, festivaling and partying. Uh, quite a bit in the House of Ardmore, uh, House of uh, Lancaster, and again they're in the most lush farmlands in the in the world mm-hmm. of Cambria. House Altharian is the North. Mm-hmm. So what you would think uh, of the Starks, you could think a little bit about what House Altharian is like, but um, they're quite different. They're a little bit more on the steampunk uh, realm, and they themselves uh, follow the way of their ancestors. So uh, House Altharian. Um, back in the day would, would uh, have dealt closely with the dwarves, which are now completely absent from the Cambrian world. They fought with the dragons and uh, ward in, in the past, and all of them disappeared from the, ha- from the world of Cambria. There are no dwarves in Cambria, uh, Cambrian lore uh, anymore. None, zero, they're gone. Mm-hmm. Um, some rumors say that they maybe have retreated into the center of the earth into some ancient city that is so deep that, that none can find it, uh, but they're gone. But Haltharian is uh, kind of what remains of, of uh, dwarven artistry, dwarven um, build uh, and, and, and architecture, and, uh, and kind of the inventing feel of what uh, they could do. They have a very powerful northern fortress, uh, an epic-sized uh, fortress built into the mountain with huge walls, and they live kind of in this ice ice world. They're very noble, uh, but they're not afraid to go to war uh, either. And um, they had the Sapphire Dragon that uh, that basically ruled over them. They hated the Sapphire Dragon so much that they actually worked with the Golden Dragon King to help kill their own dragon, <laughs> uh, which was very interesting and very uh, um, proud of, of and, and, and telling of how self uh, makes a lot of sense of, of how they are. An interesting thing is they have their own faction of experimentalists, Mm -hmm. which kind of, again, give them that interesting artillery uh, and um, kind of that steampunky feel where they get these weird, interesting inventions that they can use to to go to war with and to defend their own um, house with, which Mm -hmm. is really cool. Oh. I will. I will admit that um, when you when you mentioned them hate them hating their dragon so much, they worked with the golden dragon to to have him killed. I get the feeling that Helfarian would Helfarian would very easily would very easily say to and to anyone else who got too close and you'll forgive me if I'm forgive me for making for making a bit of meme abuse. Hippity hoppity, get the fuck off my property. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, they even uh, consumed some of their elder dragon as well, mm-hmm. uh, which went into their bloodlines, and they uh, have this. Uh, ancient machine that's inside of their deep mines mm-hmm. that they use to mix the blood of their ancestors together. And they use this as like a blood magic to empower certain special warriors in Helfarian, which is a really cool, unique uh, feel. 
House Wind in uh, almost did the opposite, where House Wind in is kind of in the center of the entire world, which is good and bad, right? It's good uh, tactically and strategically in some ways, which puts them in touch with most of the resources. Um, and they have one of the biggest iron mines because it's, it just so happened to be on these iron cliffs mm -hmm. uh, in the center of, of Cambria. However, it also puts them at <laughs> an easy reach of everybody who feels like crossing their path and going to war with them. Uh, they are a very uh, more of a republic than a normal kingdom. They've um, taken on some more new age um, laws than the normal uh, monarchs of Cambria. So they kind of have a little bit of a, a constitutional monarchy or a little bit of a democratic monarchy going on in there. Mm -hmm. And they have a court called the Sky Court uh, because they actually have uh, wyverns. So there's no dragons in Cambria left during the, the, the current time period. There's only the one golden dragon king, the only dragon in Cambria. But there are wyverns that were left behind by their dragon god, Hazalothor, the wyvern lord, king of the skies, the iron dragon who left behind these, uh, their children, so to speak. The wyvern lord didn't make um, draconians like others. Instead, they um, helped to, to bring, bring these wyverns uh, to life and gifted them to um, the House of Winden. And they actually have wyvern riders in Winden, which is really cool. So you, that's actually one of our subclasses. You can be a wyvern rider. Ironic to the current uh, uh, Drake um, Warden, I think it's called, in the new, uh, the new Fizz Bands. But uh, this is actual wyvern that is not magical in regard to uh, being able to summon them. It's actually a wyvern that you will grow with. If it dies, you actually have to go get another one. <laughs> it's a living creature, like an actual mount. Um, so it's pretty cool. And uh, they actually have wyvern clerics. Uh, it's not, they're not actually called that, but they basically are like uh, almost like Pokemon trainers. Mm -hmm. they, they train the little, very young wyverns at a very young age. And when they get a little bit older, then they return them back to the Citadel and get a new one to continue to train. Mm -hmm. And those wyverns grow up to be wyvern rider wyverns. So it's kind of this interesting, uh, interesting feel for the, for the Sky Court. Mm hmm so those are um, basically the four main human, uh, human centric houses. I'll call them. Mm -hmm. Then there's kind of the uh, the mix, the amalgamation of everybody, called the Arcadian Dominion, which are more. It's more of a uh, it's more of a, a house built on wizards and magic users mm -hmm. and sorcerers and uh, uh, scholars and very smart people uh, from around the world that decided to. Uh, basically move off to the north of Cambria, the northeast, and kind of take over their own little peninsula. But they accept basically all the races. Anybody who wants to join them can. And so they have some strange um, characters from all around, but they're, they're one of the most powerful magic houses in Cambria. They're a little smaller. They don't have all the resources in the world, but they have magic galore. And they have basically the most powerful um, war mages, and, um, and and all of those types. Mm -hmm. They also run a faction called the Watchtower, which is a quasi-secret order that will basically hunt down rogue mages and uh, and and rogue magic users throughout the throughout the realm of Cambria, mm -hmm. which is pretty interesting as well. Um, that's uh, Arcadian Dominion, and the Arcadian Dominion um, they also actually have um, the Diamond Draconians, which are extremely rare, and they live within Arcadian Dominion. They weren't. Uh, they weren't made in such a high quantity like some of the other Draconians. They were more made as like super soldiers. Uh, <laughs> much, much, uh, much fewer for Arcadia, the Ensorcel, the Essence Binder, that dragon who basically created their own their own um, world of wizards up in the north. Kind of the uh, the Hogwarts mixed with uh, Wizard World, <laughs> mm -hmm. where uh, where the Diamond Draconians are too. So. A very interesting and, and, and rare uh, diamond uh, draconian race also lives within, within them. Mm -hmm. uh, then another more human-esque centric house, but a little bit fey skewed, I'll call it, is Clan Gulf. And they're, uh, they're based all on the water in Sea Spire. So they have kind of pirates, seafaring, um, and that type of uh, uh, kind of a feel. But uh, they are... Um, 
not a normal monarchy. They're actually run by uh, the High Admiral. Mm -hmm. um, and again, they're the strongest seafaring house among all of them. And so they, uh, they kind of have like this whole council of, of admirals and, and, and all these other captains. And the, the one who gets to rule their house is the captain of a ship that has the highest wealth among them all. So they kind of have a very piratey type of a theme and feel to them. Um, and they, uh, they interestingly, um, they all worship these uh, ancient uh, sea creatures. So there's like a kraken and, uh, and kind of these cool ancient magical sea creature gods that uh, kind of put them at odds with their own dragon, um, Marak Barun, the aquamarine dragon, mm -hmm. uh, which is very, very interesting and, and, and cool. So some of them kind of believed in that. Some of them just stayed with their own, their own fae. So they actually have some, some water breathing characters and some fae from that house that make them very, very unique and interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, they also have a kind of a, they're the only house that has a submarine, a uh, magical uh, submarine, a uh, submarining uh, uh, vessel, which is pretty cool as well, uh, that a secret society uses. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, they're a very, very cool, interesting house. If you like pirates and, 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 and going on the sea in any way, shape or form, Clan Gelf is for you. Uh, the people who play in Clan Gelf uh, never want to leave. <laughs> they love it. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of all of the houses that are more human centric. Mm -hmm. Then we'll go into the draconians. So there are three main draconian factions that have a, a big population that still exist in Cambria. And the first one is the blood of Vermithrax. And so rather than being a normal house, these are actually the descendants of their, their dragon God, Vermithrax uh, himself. And uh, Vermithrax um, was basically a very honorable almost like a samurai-esque feeling ruby dragon, meaning mm -hmm. uh, cross between Klingons and samurai is what you would think of Vermithrax as. Oh, so, are... so, so, so Klingons from the undiscovered country. Got it. Yes, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yes. Basically, that's, that's Vermithrax. They live in one of the harshest in environments, basically in a molten lava-filled Mordor. Uh, but they're not evil. Some people think that some some houses, of course, hate them, think they're evil, mm -hmm. but they're just an honorable, very strong, very regimented army like army centric, military centric um, house. They're all about that, that honor based system um, and they they take it very seriously. Oh, when um, it comes to when it comes to their sense of honor, that is um, that's some that's something that I think I think I think I need to narrow down a, a little bit because. Um, and it, it's fun. It's funny you bring up Klingons because there's a, because I've always heard the talk of how can Klingons talk about ho the whole honor thing when they use cloaking devices on birds of prey. Um, it's there's a difference between external and internal honor. Um, external honor is is usually the the mix of your achieve your your place within the group and your achievements within it. A horizontal and vertical thing, whereas internal is more is is the kind of is the kind of honor that showed up in po in um post enlightenment. Um, that be that being adherence to one's person to one's personal code, which is why accusing someone of hypocrisy is a common rhetorical tactic. Um, in that regard, where where would would they be more on the external honor or um a mix of both? I would say they're a mix of both. Um, they don't like humans, so when they look at what some humans do, like the way they slew some of their own dragons and things like that, or the way they deal with specific things, the way they uh, do so much behind each other's backs, they, they're more about that outward, um, let's, let's do this honorable. If we make a deal, we're going to keep that deal. They're more lawful type of alignment, type of a faction. Whether they, you know, will go and slaughter your entire, <laughs> the entire town um out of out of their way you know they'll do that but you know will they uh will they do it in such a way where they're not just going to go and and steal and and, and um you know pillage and whatnot that's not really their way as much as it is to uh, keep their word you know and to to um to have their own code you know what i mean mm -hmm. the tradition you know and and kind of the reverence for their own dragon's ways is, is a little bit more of that feel. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You know, very fiery, of course. Mm-hmm. They're, they they got the red dragon, the ruby dragon. Yeah. Um, Herbithrax. So, so very interesting. And of course, some of them are different. Mm-hmm. Of course, it, it depends on the person, but that's their general structure of their house. Um, in Cormann, the, the heart of the mountain itself, mm-hmm. which is pretty cool. The Ashbridge Empire is um, almost a uh, polar opposite in a way. They're much more warm, but they're more about the dream. They're, they're probably the second most powerful magical house, if mm-hmm. not equal to the Arcadian Dominion, uh, but more in a um, more in an innate magical uh, way, mm-hmm. where they um, they believe in like more of a wisdom and family and um, and their dream. And that anything can be possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ashbridge is, uh, is is more of a benevolent, good dragon that was was trying to protect ways and, and protect this protect their people and and do great things, but um, still needed essence to live. And so, um, you know, they kind of go by that way, and they're more they have more of um, the desert feel and vibe to them, where they live off the land, they respect the the, the land and the ways around them but very mystical. They have that very mystical and wise feel about them. They seek wisdom. Um, and so they, they kind of have their own path and they're young people, they follow these paths, but they also have some tribal aspects to them. So they kind of have um, these interesting classes that, that are about very powerful combat that emulate the natural feel of dervishes and, and whirling scimitars and, and the feel of that, um, that savage, dangerous feel of the desert that uh that they can they can become when needed so uh they they have those very very powerful magical feel to them and their their citadel narkul Mm -hmm. in the ashbridge empire just has that uh that oasis within the desert feel um while while also being a kind of a lost uh lost place to to normal individuals to normal travel it's it's kind of an out of the way uh place to go um, not as <laughs> difficult to travel as something like the Vermithrax area in, mm-hmm. in Cormium and, and like a lava, you know, um, uh, fireland, but uh, uh, fireland in its own right. If I, wanted, yeah. if I wanted an outright fireland, I'd move to Arizona. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Um, the Karakong Legion mm-hmm. is the last of the great draconian houses, and they are... Uh, completely different than the other two where they're a very free land. They actually Mm -hmm. also have some humans within them, which is completely different than the other two. The other two are pretty much all draconians. It would be very rare to find another race other than a Vermithrax in Vermithrax or or the Ashbridge draconian Ashbridge. But in Karakung, they actually would have potentially some humans or some other random races within them Mm -hmm. because they're more of a Mad Max feeling uh beyond the thunderdome feeling type of a faction they uh they they basically run their own part of a desert on the other side of of uh of cambria but uh it's a little bit more of a canyony feeling area um and on the outside they seem like uh kind of more like a barbarian um uh, big gigantic mega tribe Mm -hmm. um but uh, on the inside they're more of a um, a family, mm-hmm. so to speak, and they have a many many hidden tradition of their family. So a little bit like what you would think of the orcs in World of Warcraft. Yeah, that's that's where I was going to go with the the horde, just the horde, just all the horde stories as a whole in feel. Warcraft. Exactly. So the horde feel in, in World of Warcraft or Warcraft in general, um, with a little bit of that. Uh, that hidden um, mystical uh, ism within their own faction. They have kind of these hidden well, this hidden well that has magic and power. And the copper dragon um, that was their god, the Karakum, the war caller of destiny, the copper dragon itself, was was uh, actually again a, a bit of a benevolent type of a dragon that that taught them um, how to be strong and how to scavenge from the land and use use things from the land. So they oftentimes Karakum are, are are looked at as, as savage because they don't wear you know, forged armor and, and, and clean things. They, mm-hmm. they they take armor and pieces from maybe the fallen enemies that they defeated and put together their own stuff, um, sometimes even better than it was before. But uh, generally, they're more of a scavenging house 
um, seen seen as uh, more more barbaric, but um, they are very very interesting, and they have some very uh, interesting, powerful magic and ways to fight among them as well, um, making them a little bit more of the chaotic uh, of the three. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, Ashbridge is more like of the chaotic good. Karakung might be seen more chaotic evil, but they're more of a neutral type of a house where they're mm-hmm. they're more like in the in the middle. Um, yep. uh, but very 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 interesting. Um, a dragon, a draconian house. Yeah. And uh, last but not least of the great houses is the dynasty of Sherlindria. Mm-hmm. Uh, they betrayed all of their brethren, the other elves of the world, um, because their uh, their platinum dragon, uh, Sherlindria, the immortal star, the most powerful of all the dragons, um, was basically controlled by the golden dragon. Um, I don't know if you've ever played Jade Empire the video game. Ooh, oh you know, yes, <laughs> I, I've I've played and I've I've um I've done a few podcasts about in, about integrating some of these styles into various um, RPGs. I'm and I still have the um, in style mod on my version on my version of the game. Jade Empire is is an amazing game that I think is so underrated and so overlooked over the years. Mm-hmm. The story was was just so well done, but imagine the. Uh, the grand strategist here is the mm-hmm. golden dragon king and uh the main character your you know your your powerful fighter the spirit know, monk is, that's right the monk himself exactly uh is the platinum dragon here like this 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 basically mortal badass fighter who can't be beat and so that weakness was instilled in the in the platinum dragon and and the platinum dragon was used to help to finish off the other dragon gods, because again, the golden dragon king was friends with everybody mm-hmm. and planned the demise and downfall of all the other dragons. And most of them were able to kill each other, but the ones that weren't completely put down, he used the, uh, the platinum dragon to help finish them off. And then of course, with that instilled weakness was able to finish off the platinum dragon. Mm-hmm. But again, the influence of this dragon on their house was to get rid of any of the elves that were maybe perhaps too privy of the truth. Um, and so many of the other elves were defeated, destroyed, um, pushed out of their lands. And so uh, even though it sa- seems super evil, the dynasty of, the dynasty of Sherlindria now is, is the last uh, full elven house. But they're not a normal uh, standard elf. Uh, they are kind of a yin and yang feel because we created kind of um, two new slash refreshed races of elves. We wanted to... Uh, bring in uh, an interesting feel. So they're the celestial elves. And so they have uh, sunlight elves and moonlight elves. Mm-hmm. The sunlight elves are more of the, the ones that go out and be diplomats and that, that, that run the kingdom during the day. The ones that are more of the faces, the ones that deal with, uh, you know, the, the money in the banks and, and, uh, and selling things and all that kind of stuff. Whereas the moonlight elves are more of the, the spies and the, uh, the nighttime dealing folk. Um, those who do the dirty work, you know, and, and um, some who also, in a really cool way, ride in, ride on bats. Mm-hmm. Um, they they have they have giant bats that they can ride, which I think is awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> they are um, also one of the other top. They're one of the top three most powerful magic houses in Cambria. They have tons of magical innate power, and so they are in this interesting uh, jungle. Um, island climate so they're they're the uh they're also the second on the um the ship fairing uh of the of the houses so gulf is is pretty clearly number one but the dynasty of sherlindria have also great sea prowess Mm -hmm. uh in the world and uh they're they're up there with number two as another island society Mm -hmm. and so the yin and yang of these elves these celestial elves kind of are very weird and exotic they keep to themselves very often but when they deal with other factions um, it's, it's usually a very, uh, impactful, um, uh, thing that, that occurs there. They're another very lawful house, uh, mm-hmm. now after all of these years, but, uh, some who know the truth of, of some of the members of their original, uh, faction know that, that some crazy things happened in the past mm-hmm. and behind the scenes. But, uh, the ruler of their house is interesting. They have to actually be born into an interesting line of these elves that are not just a sunlight elf but also Moonlight Elf. So the ruler of their house is both mm-hmm. uh, Sunlight and Moonlight Elf. So they have both innate magics within them. Uh, and they use some soul magic, and and, um, and which is kind of forbidden 
and they use these uh, very powerful soul crystals where they can take essence uh, like their their ancient dragon did and use that magic for their own. Mm-hmm. So those are the those are all of the great houses of Cambria. Um, the last faction that players can play in is the guild, and the guild the players can be from any any house in all of Cambria. The guild is basically a gigantic trading merchant black market assassins uh, spying uh, super guild mm-hmm. that is not a true house they do not fight in the ascension but they heavily participate as they control basically the quote unquote stock market of cambria mm-hmm. um, they could do anything make anything happen uh, they are great friends with the golden dragon king uh, but also almost ignored by the golden dragon king in a way the guild father is kind of like the dread pirate roberts in that it is an honorary high ruler king-like ability a power mm-hmm. that is passed down from guild father to guild father as if they never die and so the guild father is like an immortal type figure mm-hmm. that rules over the guild but again the guild is not a true house there are places called trading posts within every single kingdom and it creates this network uh, kind of this giant spy network, this guild network that is throughout all of the houses. Mm-hmm. They're not like maesters, but they're there to help each house get things that they need, do things that they need, find out information. Uh, but they play all sides, and it's all about gold for them. All they want to do is make money as a guild, um, but they they can pretty much do anything. And they recruit from all of the different houses. Some pl- Sometimes pl- characters will get exiled from houses, or something will go wrong, and they'll end up, you know, losing their 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 home or or something something happens they, they feel like joining the guild um and so any any faction character can join the guild but it changes what their house boon is by being in the guild mm-hmm. and makes them a very unique and interesting neutral type of character yeah. so those are basically all the factions mm-hmm. in, in dragon thrones it was a lot i yeah. went over a lot of information i know and um, it's a big it's a big world with that in, with that in mind i would like to i would I, I always like to put th- I always like to put things in co- in um, context, and I, I will note as an aside, um, as you were as I was going as I was going through the different houses, um, I ended up getting reminded of the Heroes and Might of Might and Magic series, a game yeah. series that is completely balanced with no possible exploits whatsoever. Nope, none, <laughs> sorry. Pay no pay no attention to the genie wrecking everything in sight. Pay no attention to it. <laughs> um. <laughs> But given the, given the fact that I had mentioned earlier the the um fa- the faction setup when it came to um, Legend of the Five Rings, I'm I'm a big I'd like to put things into practice by go, by by bringing up the by bringing up a bit of the clans and what and what would what would be a what would be a rough equivalent for them in um in Dragon Thrones. If you if you don't uh, if you don't mind to kind of to kind of put things in the to kind of put things into practice with a little bit of parallel. You know, I uh, I played Legend of Five Rings many years ago. Mm-hmm. I'm not as versed anymore as I once was. I played I, a little bit of the LCG recently, the newer one by Fantasy Flight. Um, but I just I just don't have a proper grasp on L five R. As I used to years ago. I can give um, you a bit of a refresher on each to if that if that'll help. Sure. All right. I'll start with the I'll start with the crab clan. They um because of, because of because of the fact that they are they are the ones who are basically the wardens of the south, um gar- guarding the Caillou Wall from the sh- from the Shadowlands. They they are they tend to be very they tend to be very good fighters, but they also are not very good at the whole social niceties thing. Right. Um, that sounds like a combination between Karakung and Helfarian. Mm-hmm. Can... Maybe even a little bit of Winden somewhere in there, because yeah. Helfarian and Winden both had to defend their own lands, mm-hmm. and Winden is always at war with the Draconians because Winden is on the border with with Vermithrax. Mm-hmm. and they're they're two kind of different uh, ideologies uh that go against each other but uh the crab clan sounds a little bit like what stark would be like because they're they're defending the their their own uh ways from the shadowlands as you said um mm-hmm. so so you know Alfarian like kind of guards the north from monsters and things that come through so it's a little bit of a combo 
Mm-hmm. Which uh, I have a feeling is going to happen with a lot of these. Yeah, that's that's something that's something I I had prepared I had prepared for. Um, next is the crane, known it also called the emperor's left hand. They t they tend they tend to pursue excellence in all that they do, whether it be whether it be excellence in politics, excellence in art, or excellence in um, dueling. In, fa in fact, they practically wrote the book on Iaijutsu duels in Rokugan. That's going to be Ardmore. Probably the, the top one is probably Ardmore, most likely. Ardmore uh, really likes to try to be excellent and show off. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they like to be that, that ambitious, um, you know, uh, ambitious house. Um, but mm -hmm. I'm sure any all the houses... Well, the players in the houses would probably say that they are all, uh, all trying to be excellent. Um, Lancaster has a little bit of this, but they're a little bit more um, about uh, having fun, whereas um, I think Ardmore, a little bit of wind in at times, where they they want to be great. They have they have very heavy uh, standards for each other. Uh, as a matter of fact, Winden uh, does have kind of this uh, these these marshals that work directly for the Golden Dragon King. So. Mm -hmm. um, me, you know, I would say I would say Ardmore first, maybe Winden second, would be mm -hmm. like like the crane. Yep. Um, next is the dragon, who are a bit enigmatic. They tend to they tend to keep to themselves, and they tend to be the most independent minded and most individualistic of the of the um, clans. They tend they tend to not get they tend to not get involved. They tend to take a long view of things and not get involved with inter-clan politics unless they, unless they feel it's necessary for them to do so? It's probably going to be uh, the dynasty of Sherlindria. Mm -hmm. They stay far removed until they get involved, but they have a lot of interesting, weird, and enigmatic power behind them. Mm -hmm. that, that's very similar. I would say Sherlindria is very similar to Dragon. Yeah. Um, Next is the Lion Clan, which is which is often referred to as the right hand of the Emperor. They are the they are the biggest embodiment of the warrior archetype of Bushido. They tend they they tend to not only do they tend to be the most militaristic, but they tend to be the most judgmental on anyone who does not hold who does not hold their their se their sense of high minded honor. That's Vermithrax and or <laughs> Winden. So when it comes to draconians, Vermithrax is definitely number one. Mm -hmm. Very close to Lion Clan. Yeah. Uh, next is the Mantis Clan, which is an in which is an interesting bunch. The Mantis Clan was not one of the original seven clans. It what well, originally it was an alliance of minor clans led led by the at the time the minor Mantis Clan, called the Mantis Alliance. Uh, after after a event known as the Second Day of Thunder. And due to their contributions in it, they were elevated to great clan status. They, t they, when it comes to anything ship related, they tend to be the go tos for it. As well as the fact that their um, shugenja have have talents for weather manipulation. It's got to be golf. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense with the ships and with not being like a normal true great clan, kind of like golf, where mm -hmm. you know they don't have the normal king and queen feel. They don't have that normal court-like feel they're more free in mm -hmm. a way you know yep um next would be the phoenix clan who's often referred to as the voice of the emperor the phoenix clan tend to tend, um aside from the fact that they're the, that they are the appointed guardians of the writings of the of the monk shinsei who was instrumental in forming the empire um when it comes to when it comes to the the, when it comes to the the pursuit of ma the both the pursuit of magic and the pursuit of spiritualism, they tend to be the most well known and the most traditional in that regard. That's a tough one. This is going to be a toss up between our uh, uh, excuse me Ashbridge mm -hmm. and the Arcadian Dominion. Yeah, it's one or the other. Um, I'll probably lean toward Arcadian Dominion, but it's a, it's a tough one. They're both very spiritual. Ashbridge is a little bit more. Uh, trying to tap into the dream plane, whereas Arcadian Dominion is more about the pursuit of science, scientific type knowledge. You mm -hmm. know, so it's more like wizards versus uh, 
you know, sorcerers in a way, you know? Yeah. Um, now, next is the Scorpion Clan, which is one of my favorites. The Scorpions are a very, in, are a very interesting paradox. They are, the other clans look at them as, as liars, cheaters, and thieves, but they are extremely loyal liars, cheaters, and thieves. They they are they're referred to as the Emperor's underhand. They um, they are the they're the ones who portray who. Are seen, who are seen as the villains by the other, by the other clans, and they utilize the, they and that is a that is a reputation that they cultivate so that they can so that they can move freely, while while everyone else is suspecting the obvious parts of them. What does that sound like to you? Because I know exactly which one that sounds like to me. Um, the guild. I would say I would you know if I was going to use a normal house, it would be Karakum, mm -hmm. but it would definitely sound like the guild as well. It's a Karakum guild toss up. Yeah. If it's one of the regular houses, it's kind of like Karakum, where everybody sees them as like evil, but but really they have you know they're 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 not just evil; they're they're loyal to themselves and and they do things for themselves. The guild is, is another perfect um, uh, parallel as well. Mm -hmm. Now, the ne the next would be, and actually the actually the last in the sh in the short list would be the Unicorn Clan. Um, after the first day of thunder. The unicorn, at the time they were known as the Kirin, left the burgeoning empire to see what other threats would come about, and they they ended up leaving for several centuries. They came when they came back, they were they were they were the descendants of effectively this ro this roving tribe where they have a mix of all the different cultures that they um that they pa that they passed through over those years. Some um some some cultures from the burning sands some 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 more um some more mongolian and more and more chinese influences there are a, they're a hodgepodge that's seen, that's that has this outsider status with the rest of the clans because of how many um how many descendants of foreigners are in, are within it huh you know that makes me feel like it's a little bit more like arcadian dominion because of the 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 ability to um, kind of let anybody join, mm -hmm. um, kind of being more open to to others, makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, although, again, because they're kind of out of the empire, it's almost like they're searching for something, which is a little bit like uh, Ashbridge in a way as well. Yeah. But it sounds a little bit more like Arcadian Dominion with the mm -hmm. fact that they they're more open. Yeah. I had thought about doing something similar with this with the great houses and BattleTech, but as I but I don't but I don't I don't think it's going to be all that applicable. These are very close. You're right. There's a lot of themes that are that have that feel in in L5R to what we're doing. I mean, certainly they're <laughs> they're very different, obviously, but they they have a lot of the the, the uniqueness um, mm -hmm. in the different houses. Oh yeah. Now. With that, with now obviously going over going over the subclasses, there's no, there's no way we could do that in one interview alone. There's so, a lot. I, so I'd like to shift instead to the manipulator class and what that's bringing to the table. Absolutely, yeah. The manipulator class. See, normally we would stay away from trying to create a new base class, but because mm -hmm. we're so political uh, in in Dragon Thrones, we wanted to create a class that was non magical. That was charisma forward. That was based on charisma and more of an intelligence role. So this is a type of character that creates uh, that we've created unique subclasses for. That is all about social dynamic and being a non-magical face. So imagine a bard or a rogue that doesn't use any magic. That's not rogue themed. A diplomancer. A diplomancer. Yeah, that's right. And they're they're either completely non-magical and some of them have like ultra little tiny magic or some other you know reason for using some sort of a magic item or some that effect mm -hmm. but they will do different types of things such as inspire individuals to fight with and for them uh they will um they will be uh different uh spot they have different like spy like abilities um so let me uh let me let me open up a couple of the subclasses in my document I can give you a little bit of a, a little bit more of a, a teaser based on them, depending on how, how deep you want to go into them. Mm -hmm. But uh, but just imagine imagine a a a, a face 
that that can do things like inspire and 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 change the feel of combat without having to use any kind of magical means um which in a lot of ways is pretty powerful because it can't be countered uh and the resistances are going to be a little bit different than than the norm that that you're used to so it kind of creates that little bit of a a feel we're thinking you know what what's what's not been done and this is kind of one of those one of those classes that's really you know not really been done uh, but again it's really because dragon throne makes a lot of sense to have these unique political type uh, base characters that um that really get you into it uh, a couple of key manipulator um abilities to look at are are things like being you know uh kind of always a step ahead having that little extra uh, like wit about you um you know being kind of like the right hand guy to you know um some of the high up individuals in your house you know to be able to go and and, and do their bidding in other houses mm-hmm. and and the such you know and having these cunning type abilities you know how uh, kind of battle masters work? They have a bit of that battle master mm-hmm. feel in some ways. Instead of getting strategic dice, they'll get cunning dice. Mm-hmm. And it'll give them the ability to to add uh, D6s to unique tactics um, and special saving throws. Um, they'll have special tactical acumen that allows them to use words and gestures, changing of postures like thematically in their role playing during combat and such um, to react to them to kind of mess with play mess with different characters roles which is pretty interesting so i don't know if you played or or read much about um, uh, kind of the uh, the time magic the chronomancy in uh in dnd yeah but it has a little bit of that feel in a way but it's using uh it's using cunning instead of magic so you can kind of either help by inspiring, getting off tips to the other characters, or you can hinder and distract enemies and mess with their roles using your cunning dice, mm-hmm. which is kind of a cool uh, manipulator ability. Um, there are multiple ma- manipulator archetypes. There's different subclasses that you can be. Um, you could be like a dignitary, uh, an arcane emissary, a mentalist, a mm-hmm. charmer, or an agent. And they're all kind of different, uh, different feels, and they all have lots of different cool abilities. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but basically, you're using these, these cunning dice to, to use your charisma to influence the battlefield. Mm-hmm. Instilling doubt, distracting, inspiring um, uh, without using magic. Yeah. Now, when it comes to essence... Which is an which is an optional rule that you're that you're putting in. You've described it as um as it as it tied to house boons and inspiration like abilities. Um. Where where is where is essence similar to and where is it different from inspiration? So uh, in, essence is is inspiration, but it can be uh, stockpiled. You can get multiple, and so it's like an enhanced. Uh, um, basic version it's an enhanced more uh, advanced version of the basic inspiration system Mm -hmm. so you can use it to gain advantage you can use it to upcast spells which is a very interesting method so like instead of using um, spell slots you can use multiple essence Mm -hmm. to upcast spells which is kind of fun so it's kind of like you're using extra magic from cambria to do a little bit more um again it's going to cost it costs a lot more than uh it costs like a few essence to be able to do that. It's not just one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, once you stockpile enough of it, you know, it allows you to slightly upcast the spell, do a little more damage, do something a little bit more powerful with your essence, which is kind of gives players just more freedom and DMs, GMs more freedom with their enemies. So with, with monsters and, and NPCs, they also can use essence, which is cool. So mm-hmm. you can kind of, uh, instead of just using legendary actions, you can use essence to kind of have a little bit more of a, a fun, uh, unique way to do it. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the Dragon Thrones powers. So there's going to be unique racial, uh, class-like features and different house boons mm-hmm. that you'll be using um, in those ways as well. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you were able to see like the sample, mm-hmm. 
-hmm. But, uh, you know, there's all different types of house boon powers that are fairly powerful that mm -hmm. are powered by essence. They're not all powered by essence, but some of them are powered by essence, which give you that, that you know, ease of use. And again, they're optional rules because we want you to be able to use these subclasses and, and classes in your own games as well. Mm -hmm. So if you like a subclass from Dragon Blood, you want to be able to take it into regular D&D &D and be able to use it. Um, and so if you don't want to use the essence rules, you don't have to use those. Yeah. You know, so it makes it a little bit more open. Um, something I did find interesting that you that um that that I saw in the in the pre in the preview for um House Ardmore is the is the fact that the that um there's a that there's a list of available races classes and subclasses for 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 um players who are from that house and yeah when it when it came to that was um what was the what was the reasoning for make for making certain for making certain for making certain races and classes um off the table for it's, certain again, houses. it's not that they're 100 percent off the table like if somebody really wants to play this and they want to be from that house they can be it's just thematically those classes are not a prevalent main thing you'll see there so for instance if you wanted to be a cleric from vermithrax mm -hmm. technically you could be a cleric from vermithrax but you're not going to have the normal gods that you would have in DD that you'll be worshiping or there won't be temples that you can find you you would have been bestowed that power by your great dragon's spirit, okay? And so you you kind of are going to be on your own. You're going to be super special, a unique character. So you can be those other classes, but they're not going to be something you're normally going to see. So we we encourage you to play the classes thematically from these these backgrounds because we basically balance them throughout the ten houses to thematically instill them with the the background and feel of each house so not only are we giving you um class subclass suggestions but those class subclass suggestions also have descriptions behind them mm -hmm. that tell you what that subclass really is in this house thematically only mm -hmm. so it doesn't necessarily change any mechanics it's just you know if you're this type of paladin from this house you know you are you look like this and you might act this way and you're from this area and you believe in this, you know, so it, it gives you a little bit more role play ability. Mm -hmm. Now with, uh, with all of, with all of that, in, with all that in mind, um, how, how many, how many pages are barring stretch goals? How many pages are you shoot? Are you shooting for total? <laughs> it's going to be a lot. As you can see, with just this one house dock, it's over 30 pages. You got 10 houses plus potentially the guild. It's going to be like a 350, 400 page book for just the core book alone. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Game Master's Guide is going to be probably a little bit smaller, but it's going to have the full atlas. It's going to have all of the citadels in it for the Game Master's Guide. It's going to have um, all of the monsters, the entire beast area of Cambria, telling you what monsters that exist in Cambria mm -hmm. that you can look up as a reference going to give you full encounter tables random or just pick whatever you want encounter tables mm -hmm. for all of the different locations um it's going to give you kind of all of the background rules special artifacts magic items npcs all that stuff mm -hmm. which is going to probably be about a 300 page dm's guide then we have the 11 chapter uh, adventure campaign as well um which is going to have it's a ton of content as well each one of those chapters is over 20 plus pages maybe 30 pages each as well so <laughs> well, total is going to probably be about probably just around a thousand pages of content here, mm -hmm. at least. Yeah. And what what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Uh, well, I mean, most of uh, the vast majority of this content, except for some of the monster generation, is complete. Mm -hmm. uh, at least in a, a either a first draft or in the uh, improving editing form, mm -hmm. which is really good news. So. Um, once we're done with the Kickstarter, the next step is to go to layout, and that'll probably take a couple months mm -hmm. uh, in layout. So we could probably go to print early 2022, uh, and if we go to print early 2022, then we should be able to make uh, a July release pretty pretty reasonable in 2022, mm -hmm. barring and, any shipping issues, of course. Yeah, but I, I'd, ima I'd imagine that 
Well, uh, well, obviously you're not going to have to deal with shipping issues with the PDF version. That's true, one hundred percent. But with all, but I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how it uh, how it progresses. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on t to come into my temple and enjoy the insanity at play here. Absolutely, it's been a lot of fun talking mm -hmm. about RPGs, reminiscing, mm -hmm. talking all about Dragon Thrones, which I obviously could talk for about about it for hours because there's mm -hmm. so much content. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> we just we were able to scratch the surface, but it's great to be able to go over it and and kind of compare it and contrast it with different things. Mm -hmm. Which again, uh, I'm I'm a I'm a role player of every single game you can imagine. I don't hate on any games. I'll try anything once, and I I love so many different games. So. Mm -hmm. You know, I take all that ex inspiration and, and, and experience and put it into our own unique world and our own our own uh, setting here for Dragon Thrones. And uh, I'm glad we were able to talk about it today. Thanks yeah. a lot for, uh, for having me here in the temple. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further go into Dragon Thrones or or just to shit post about the about the uh, about the bard dying for the umpteenth time, the door is always open. As I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you very much. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay Fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>